women, the ladies' man is an irresistible figure. To others, he is a repulsive one. Others. Tragic. Tragic. Oh my god, I have guests! Look who showed up! Look who turned up! Hi, everybody! Yeah, I've just been reading this for you, you know. It just um, ended up being the most viewed video somehow on my channel and it somehow requires the least amount of effort. Why are you guys like this? Why is the world like this in general? It's like, oh, I'm having most fun and least amount of effort. And then when I research for hours, it's like 100 views. Thank you. That, that's me saying thank you, like, because I'm a normal person. But we are back to true detective T. And, you know, I'm still in my PJs technically because I slept in this thing. But, uh, yeah, I moved on from that area because I could hear my own sleepers in the video. And I'm not really pro at editing. You don't care about that. Look at this thing. I might or might not have bought this particular issue because of this title. It says, Little Ladies, Victim Castrated with Scissors While Still Alive. Also, what I find fascinating and why I'm actually doing this is when I edit and I look up these people, I'm like, hey, maybe let's include other pictures that are not just black and white. But technically that doesn't work because there aren't really any pictures of these victims online. Because this is again an issue from 1990. I have ordered a new one. I'm super excited. October is going to be great. I think that issue is actually from the 70s. I oh, forgot. It's, it's great. Today I bring you one story, but it is a story. I just mainly wanted to cover this to get you guys to debate in comments because, well, there's just, there have been some statements that have been made about this victim and I'm like, I'm not sure I would agree personally myself. Also, it just kind of shows how people used to victim blame a lot in the 90s. So, this is a story where we're going to debate if somebody is castrated, are they still a man? I know. Wild. Let's do it. Little ladies, victim castrated with scissors while still alive. What can that be about? What on earth can that be about? Well, the beginning is already super promising. To some women, the ladies' man is an irresistible figure. To others, he is a repulsive one. Others. To still other women, he is both irresistible and repulsive. Doesn't exist. That, no, no. Irresistibly repulsive. Such split feelings are hard to resolve sometimes. To caress him or to kill him, which will it be? Rick Williams inspired such feelings in women. So, this guy was like... <laughs> this description. This could have only happened in year 1990. So they describe him as um, 13 stones. So he is big, right? Yeah. Bigger than me. I don't know. Stones. Who the fuck calculates weight in stones? Okay. Six foot high. Yeah, he was big. Went for women like Kleenex tissues. Mm -hmm. He was once and for all away. Oh, I love this. I love this magazine so much. To stop tearing up over the case. Let's see. So Rick, you know, has kind of enamored. Let's say he has enamored one of these bitches, yeah. And well, she fell for him, but they actually even got married. But obviously, there has been trouble in paradise. So after some time, she has decided to leave him. They are now separated. They're living in separate places. However, on March 13th, 1986, his wife goes to the police and she's like, listen. I have tried calling him, I haven't gotten any answer. Can you just like go check up on him? You know, I still love him. So that's how this page ends. Also, my thoughts right now when reading this is that this is a huge red flag. I'm, I'm suspecting something. Like, this woman, this woman looks shady, okay? Are you, are you, are you on the same page? Like, mmm, you're calling him. It's like, I understand, yeah, you tried like his place of work, his home, but why didn't you go? You know, logical conclusion would be like, okay, he isn't answering the phone, you know, go to his place, you know where he lives to find him alive, so, suspect, alibi, there's gonna be some alibi, trust me. <laughs> Probably not, but sure. So the police and the wife go to the building and they explain their visit to the building superintendent and he agrees to unlock Williams's door. The first paragraph here, not funny. Okay, yeah, I didn't summarize this first story for you, have I? 
So this first story is truly about is man really a man without his penis, yeah? Lorena Bobbitt kind of style. So, yeah. They found Williams inside, dead. Three pairs of eyes immediately became fixed on the dead man's... on that man's naked groin. Serious business. His trousers were down, so to expose the crude mutilation, they mentioned crude. So somebody doesn't do this for a living. Who does this for a living? It's... what? <laughs> it's like sometimes I'm like, what? Who does this for a living, Maya? Jesus. Now they notice that the corpse has been actually there for a couple of days. It has been still in like decomposing state, right? Meaning, has he been mutilated before or after death? Well, I think the thing tells you in the headline, right? He has been chopped up alive. But the scene to the police can't be immediately looked staged, or it showed a possible motive, so it's usually one or the other. So there was like a bag of coke, there was a pair of scissors, mm. Mm -hmm. and there was also a steak knife. So they were like, okay, is this like a drug bust going wrong? But then it is the most personal kind of crime that you can get out there. And when they looked around, they noticed like the windows and the doors, everything was secured, meaning that this person either had a key or at least has known the victim. And immediately their first suspect, well, first of all, always has to be their wife, but then they're thinking the same, right? Why is she going to report it to the police? Why not come here? And is it to like deflect suspicion of herself, be like, well, I'm reporting it, so it can't be me. And as they were looking, so now, like, imagine you're a police officer, right, and you're looking around this man's flat, and you're like, oh, let me look for the motive, and it's not even the coke, it's not even the crime scene. This guy has pictures of naked women posing for him, just staring at them, all these naked women, around the flat, and they're like, yeah, that, that could have been considered a motive. That could arrange somebody to, to castrate a guy if he's using them as Kleenex tissues. They actually counted more than 100 pictures. So, <laughs> you know, if it was like one or two, you're like, okay, even that, not okay to have a cheat. This story teaches you never to cheat. <laughs> Does anybody here also listen to the last podcast on the left? It's the best thing, but it reminded me, I think it was Kissel, it was Ben Kissel. By the way, I watch them live, I miss live shows when it comes to podcasts. So Ben Kissel during this episode had like, <laughs> had said, your fuck buddy needs to be the most stable person ever. <laughs> you can't just be sleeping around with unstable women, because these are the consequences. The police now, obviously, everybody collects evidence, it goes to autopsy, and the police goes to the police station, and they run a check on him. They're like, who is this guy? Do we have anything on him? And sure as hell, they do. As a young man, he has been raping and sodomizing women he would meet at a bar. So he was actually accused of her because he kept her and mistreated her for like half a day, and then released her. So they're like, okay, already not a great record. Also, have all of these women, 100 women, volunteered for these pictures? Suspect. And not just that, but he has been convicted to serve a harsh sentence for rape, technically, even though, I mean, some people would disagree. So he has been convicted for 35 years, but of course he was released earlier. He only served six years for that. Then again, as he was released, he started raping women again. One of them convicted him. He went back to prison. The sentences for rape were harsh. However, then, why the parole? Why then set something super harsh? So the second one was 21 years, but then he was released after like only two years. So what's the point of setting it high when you know you're gonna parole them out? <sighs> Justice system. Okay, cool. <laughs> this is getting serious. And it's a serious case, okay? It requires seriousness. And when he went out of the prison, he started working for the cemetery and also was kind of like dealing coke on the side, hence the coke. So they're like, okay, cool. That explains the coke. So the motive is probably fully sexual. And now the autopsy. Okay, so the laceration showed that the scissors has been the instrument used. They can determine those cuts. Why leaving scissors with DNA, in any case? Then they see defensive wounds, so he had tried to defend himself, but they have cut his hand with scissors as well. So when they're placing like the sequence of events, they can see he has first been stabbed with scissors to kind of debilitate him because he was, again, a big guy. 
then the castration occurred and then he was shot to like finally get rid of him I suppose and maybe to confuse the police or like who came what came first chicken or the egg that's one way to look at it <laughs> this next page is winning so they have like um, opened up his drawers and they have found like a dress book remember how back in the day you couldn't like save phones into the number and Williams had been no more thorough in making his entries there than on his rolls of film each phone number had only a single name opposite evidently last names didn't exist in the vocabulary of the ladies men they don't care uh, I'm gonna cover Randy Croft for the podcast and probably the YouTube channel as well. And what Randy Croft is a serial killer, what he did, <laughs> like talking to him like he's the happiest man alive. Um, what he did is he used to exactly do that. So like he would mark his victims as something that would remind him like, you know, like when you meet somebody you're like, oh, that was the woman in like a yellow dress and stuff like this. This was the ladies' man problem. Okay, I never had that problem in my childhood. <laughs> It's like the only crush saved as, saved as the only crush in my phone. Not Williams. Now the police in interviewing people in Williams' life realized that he had like a line that he would sell to these women that, to get them into the studio flat. He would be like, yeah, I'm a big time photographer. Like if you come, you know, there's like hundred women around my house, totally stable as a person. No, I can propel you like in the modeling world. Like you go, you're gonna get pictures for free. It all works out for you. And one woman, one such woman bought his story and her name was Jackie Foggy. So a couple of witnesses have said like they have introduced Jackie, then like they would see her actually going towards Williams' apartment. Then another friend of his said on the day of the murder he would speak with Williams on the phone and he heard him shout Jackie like to, to somebody. But they were like, yeah, the TV was going on, it was too loud, so I'm not really 100% sure, but pretty sure that he was screaming Jackie. So, our woman Jackie, yep, yeah, you see her here? You're probably seeing her when I was reading this page. So, they went to her flat and they're like, hey, knock knock, you there? She wasn't. So, they asked like, the building superintendent again and they were like, yeah, she just left without you know, in a hurry, she just said like she was done with the flat and we think she went to live with her boyfriend but the boyfriend was apparently in the same building so the police is like, what? so they go and speak with the boyfriend the boyfriend was like, no, she just like actually left she didn't tell me where she was going she said she was tired of her apartment and wanted a change completely normal, right? unless you're a suspect in a murder investigation there's a comic here on this page and it says I prefer a filter cigarette if you have one as like the man that's just about to be shot as the guillotine or whatever they used to call them hilarious why did I make me laugh what is humor in quarantine even what is this comedy shit cool Jackie let's go back to Jackie so the police was able to locate Jackie and find her at a new address and as soon as she opened the door they would at on her face they saw like scratches it was like yeah somebody has been fighting with this woman so they're like we have our girl so they asked her to explain the injuries and it says each answer was lamer than the last woo shade and finally they crack her down when they tell her that that friend has heard the name Jackie being said by the victim she's like oh, let me tell you this sad love story so, Williams would bring her to the flat and obviously take pictures, but then he would expect sex instead of pay. So, she said Williams, she learned, was a forceful man who liked his sex varied and not always in traditional ways. Oh, God, I love 1990. Give us the dirty details. God damn it. The cost of providing him with the sex he demanded seemed to get more and more exorbitant, like he was getting more and more violent. I mean, he was raping all these victims, to be honest. But he loved his women's docile, so he would always have some, like a line of coke, keep her on coke, buy her, you know, overwhelm her with gifts and like buy her different things. And soon enough, what do you know, she's involved in his coke business and starts packing up the bags for the customers. He's like, this is not the life I intended for myself, this is not what I wanted. So when that person heard the phone call, the two of them were arguing, because she was like, but you're not technically even trying to make me a model, like my life has just gone to shit. It's like I'm basically selling drugs, packing drugs for you to sell. And then like he was angry and shouting at her as well. And once he hung up that phone, 
he picked up the gun and was brandishing it like in her direction. So she says she had got a hairspray, sprayed his eyes, like debilitated him, took the gun off him, and then proceeded to shoot at him. And then in her blind rage, she went for the scissors that she used to cut up and pack up these bags of coke and started mutilating him. And this line says, a few moments later, Richard Williams was no longer a man. Okay, does anybody else disagree? Are you, do you need a penis to be a man? I mean, it's not like he went a gender reassignment surgery. You know what I mean? What do you think? Drop it down in the comments below. And then, once she was done with him, it said all that remained, she believed, was to wash the blood off her hands. No. Yes, in the 90s, if you didn't get caught just literally bludgeoning somebody to death and having blood on your hands, yeah, you wouldn't. You would have gotten away with murder, but no. Still, no. So after she got off the coke and was just, you know, actually thinking come for herself, she was like, okay, I need to get rid of his car, right? And she burned the car, moved on with her life, and she thought, yeah, the police will never get me. Well, she was wrong. This paragraph, this is how the story ends. On the sound advice of her lawyer, Foggy proposed an outcome that would save taxpayers money and take into account the extenuating circumstances of her crime. Save taxpayers, please, as if, as if she, like, she's like, no, 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 I'm doing this for you, taxpayers. Please, please. Just they can just advise you what to do to save yourself some life to die. Well, in 1988, she got 15 years in prison for the manslaughter because she pled to manslaughter. It was like defense, which truly it probably was. But I just love how she got 15 years while, while when he was convicted, he would get 21 or like 35. So, ain't that a wild one? Was he still a man? I would say so. So, that's that for that one. I mean, those are like the interesting ones that I have found that are just wild, the cases you would never hear about otherwise from this true detective. But obviously there's more and I'm ebaying the shit out of them and ordering new ones every month to cover these cases that otherwise you wouldn't have heard about. But now, what I wanted to share with you is this page, which is the letters to the editor page. So I wanted to read out one for you. This is basically, you know how my favorite murder does like hometowns now and people read out on different shows as well, like listener story, hometown murders. Well, I wanted to comment on one of these because this was that version. I dated from back then. So I'm gonna kind of like paraphrase this one. It's called Fair Play. Just for us to see, like, what, what do you guys think? Like, wh who do you agree with? It says, in Britain we have a strong reputation for fair play. Is this fact or fiction? Continental folk comment on the presumption of innocence, something which we treasure greatly, by suggesting that everyone here is innocent whilst everyone in Europe is guilty. Why? <laughs> okay, sure. Actually, Scotland has, Scotland has a great justice system. I think this is still a thing, and the US, like everybody podcasting in the US, really would like this to happen. They have the not proven, so like there wasn't enough evidence. There was enough of reasonable doubt, so they couldn't convict a person, so it's like not just guilty or not guilty, but it's not proven. So if you prove it, then they're gonna be guilty. But I don't know if this person is talking about that, so hey. The serious side to this is the suggestion that for lawyers and politicians it is not a handicap to be at least to blame for loose conduct. In fact, it may help a little. What are you on about? One glaring example of a brilliant lawyer and politician who suffered from so-called vices was Sir Henry Curtis Bennett. He was an excellent advocate. As a prosecutor, he was cool-headed and impartial, and he defended with fervent zeal, frequently making the most absurd stories sound remarkably plausible. Wow, Henry could talk, Henry could get bitches. He reached the position of chairman of London County Sessions, and may have gone further, but then a calamity happened. A calamity happened. He was the guilty party in a divorce case. Ooh, scandalous. This was the brutal end for him in every context. At the relatively early age of 57, he collapsed with a heart condition whilst making a speech at the Dorchester Hotel, having predicted his own death about a minute earlier. Perhaps the strain and shame of social stigma contributed to this tragic condition. Many of Victorian outlook will say that he had only himself to blame and deserved no sympathy. Others will be asking the question, was justice done? What? 
he was poisoned. Yeah, that's my conclusion to this. What you mean by Sun? Give me more details. So wait, so he was the guilty part in the divorce case, right? So was the justice done because he wasn't convicted of any crime that we are accusing him of here, but instead he died of natural death and he was still an important privileged figure? Is that the dilemma? Yeah, that is a tricky one, especially when I think like when I cover true crime cases and you know I cover like people that die in prison of like heart conditions, cancers, like Marjorie, all these people, I'm like, was the justice really served? But then you kind of have to think like when they do have these conditions, they do have like certain symptoms, they do suffer as well. Um, but yeah, no, if they just kind of drop dead, probably not, especially when it comes to like murder. But also that's why I disagree with death penalty as well, to be honest, because no, they should deserve to serve in prison and have their miserable life because people are paranoid in prison and you never know what's gonna happen to you. So yeah, no, I don't like when people just don't serve their just sentences. So yeah, I guess uh, the justice was not served in this case, although I don't know the exact crime. When you write editor's letters, give the exact crime, right? Write me in your editor's letters. There's an email in the description box if you want this kind of thing read on uh, the channel. I don't know what about, about crime in general. Yeah, I mean, I tell that as if I wrote this thing, which I did not. But hey, the new one is coming, and this is it for this beautiful video. This is a weird one. Why do I do that? Yes, I wake up. <laughs> so I just woke up my eyes. I was like, castration, crime. This is my life, okay? Until the next one. I have nothing else to tell you and nothing else to say. Like absolutely nothing. So happy Monday. Appreciate your life. <laughs> Stop being me. Yeah, get a hell out. Bye guys. Bye.